Hi, everyone. I'm Hattie Tucker from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm happy to be here talking about Youth Bridge, one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. In Atlanta, we actually created a Youth Bridge program back in 2006 called Atlanta Junior Bridge. We are 501c3, a nonprofit, and our kind of our mission was to teach uh, children bridge in the Atlanta area at no charge. We've been in existence for quite some time and had our share of ups and downs. We actually created the first youth in ABC um, in 2008. And the next year, ACBL kind of took it on, and they've just done great work with it since then. So we have um, tried a lot of different things. Some worked well, some not quite so well. But I hope to, in this talk, give you some ideas of things you need to think about, things you need to consider when you're starting to organize your own program. So let's get started. One of the most uh, important things in setting up a youth program is to never forget that playing bridge is supposed to be fun and teaching bridge is also supposed to be fun. You need to enjoy what you're doing and enjoy uh, the kids you work with and the people that you work with. Before you start, think about what you want to accomplish. Ensure that everyone involved has the same goal. When we started Atlanta Junior Bridge, our goal was to introduce thousands of children to the game and give them a basic foundation that would allow them to play for the rest of their lives. Now, our hope was that some of them would become as enthralled, interested, and love the game as much as we love Bridge. But you need to make sure that you have a goal that's realistic. Understand that your goal it won't happen in a week, a month, or maybe even a year. Uh, these programs take time to create and time to develop to their full potential. Know that you'll have a series of kind of trial and error and some growing pains. Some things you try will work great. Some things not so much. And, you know, best case scenario, you have 10 or 15 people all interested. They want you to start a youth program and, or teach classes in their area. And you don't have enough teachers. Isn't that a great problem? To have? But just be realistic about your goal and be realistic about how soon you have expectations that things will come together. Takes a while. So as you get organized, things to consider. Locations, volunteers, supplies, administration and finance, marketing, and then of course your teachers, perhaps one of the most important elements not going to be that you can just walk in and throw a teacher in a classroom and everything's going to be fine. You have to do, have some other things thought out, thought through. So let's look at them one by one. Locations. So locations for teaching. Schools, great. They're a great location. We'll look at that a little bit more depth in just a moment. Churches are good locations. Recreation centers. Libraries. Uh, libraries are great if they're like community libraries. Uh, people are used to going there. It's viewed as a safe environment. The libraries are usually looking for programs that bring more kids in. They want more children in their libraries. Bridge clubs, you know, at least all the supplies are there. You don't have to flip supplies hither and yon. Um, some homeowner associations, like a group of, uh, a neighborhood group of homes will have like a clubhouse with a pool and tennis courts maybe. In a clubhouse, especially if you're talking about in the fall or winter, sometimes the clubhouses aren't that busy and you might be able to get a spot for, you know, one day a week or something. Like that. And neighborhood classes in a home. Now, be a little careful about that. There's some potential liability issues, you know, child safety, et cetera. But we had two different teachers at different times that had classes in their home, uh, neighborhood kids. So that's a thought. Thinking about schools versus, for instance, a bridge club. So there's some pluses and minuses. In schools, kids are already at the school. So there's no travel required. The parents don't have to make a special trip to get them to bridge. Parents also feel that school is a safe environment. You know, that's, they feel confident that when their child's there, they're safe. Uh, messages sent home from a teacher or the school are always read. 
you know, they're used to getting things from the school and they'll read them. And teachers know how the system works. They can arrange field trips, uh, field trips to a tournament or uh, a bridge club, or who knows, maybe even the youth in ABC. And some of the minuses is sometimes it's hard to make the transition from a school activity to a community activity. Um, you know, there are, the parents are used to think of it as this is something they do in school. And often the bridge teacher or player often doesn't meet the parents directly. Many of the programs are before school or after school programs. So the parents have dropped their kids off and or are just picking them up. They never actually come in the building, so you don't meet them. Clubs, well, parents have to bring their kids to class. They have to be responsible for getting their kids to class. And that's another trip and another obligation that they have to do. Parents aren't familiar with the people, the teacher or the other parents. So it's a strange environment. It's an environment they're not used to and they don't know if it's safe. They're worried about leaving their kids. There's some things you can do to help alleviate that, like letting the parents stay in the room. I wouldn't have them uh, learning at the same table as the children uh, because they want to help too much. Sometimes that's a little intimidating for the kids, but they could certainly have a table in the back of the room and participate in the class or uh, read or work on their computer, but they don't have to just drop the kids off and leave. And that might make them feel a little more comfortable. Uh, messages concerning games, camps, or playing opportunities may not get read. You send a message home, the parent may put it to the side. They don't have that sense of urgency that they would for school messages. Now, the pluses are once the parents have met you and see their child likes bridge, they buy into the camps and games. They see that their child is, his grades are better or they're more at ease talking to people um, or they're just having a really good time and having fun. So once they see that their child likes it and they've met you and they, they like you, now they feel more comfortable with their child being there. Parents can become an end to the schools. If you've been teaching in a summer camp all summer, now school starts back, kids are in school. If you say to a parent, well, we'd like to get a school program started, they can vouch for you with the school. So that sometimes that helps you get in. Parents are used to raising money for various projects for school, so they can become fundraisers for them. They can also become volunteers, especially if they've learned any bridge at all. You might find that they're willing to help with an uh, in-school class. And who knows, maybe the parents will learn bridge and you'll have some new members. That would be fun, right? You also think, have to think about where you're going to store your supplies. You need to have a central location that um, kind of everyone knows to go to you find the supplies. Uh, it needs to be accessible to everyone. It needs to be safe. Maybe it's a bridge club. Maybe it's a condition storage space, but you need to have multiple keys and put a checklist in there, um, you know, of what teachers will need to conduct the class, help them remember, I'll need this and this and this, and have a sign up sheet so you know where your supplies are. You need a place to hold meetings. Um, a bridge club is a neutral place, so that's Kind of a good place to all meetings, but we've had them in, in our homes uh, during the class. And where are you going to store documents? Remember that if you are an organization that is accepting donations and things like that, you're going to have some financial documents and you're going to have some information about the kids. Maybe you have insurance. If they're in, if they're held by a person, what happens if that person gets sick or becomes ill? you know, dies, heaven forbid. Well, those documents may be hard to find. So you need to have backup um, in the cloud or a second copy of those documents with someone else or the documents kept in a central location. And you need a place to conduct your financial and administrative duties. You might have contracts to write. You now might need to pay teachers, pay for supplies. Um, all kinds of things like that. Is that going to be in someone's home? Um, or is it going to be in a room at the club or what? But you need to think about where those things are going to happen. Volunteers. What is your volunteer base? What kind of volunteers do you have available? Excuse me. 
you'll need someone to find, store, and move supplies for classes and games. Um, many of your teachers are, I should say not many, but some of your teachers may be older. It may be difficult for them to move a lot of supplies from their car to a class or to set up a, a game or something like that. So you need to think about who is who is going to help them do that? Who is going to um, make all the moving parts accessible when you're trying to do something special or just hold a class? You're going to need volunteers to organize fundraisers and raise money. That's not going to happen just all on its own. The money just doesn't appear. You need someone to help you organize that. And it needs to be someone that's good at that. Somebody who maybe has raised money for another charity or someone who just doesn't ask, don't, doesn't mind asking people for money. You're going to need to market your classes. You need to find someone that knows how to do marketing. Um, you need to advertise your program. You need to be visible. So you're going to need to advertise your classes and your organization. You need flyers, posters, pictures, websites on Instagram, Facebook. Be visible. Um, so that you can build on your successes and make your successes visible to your donors. You need people to help with the administration, build student lists, organize field trips. You're going to have a lot of information about the students in your classes. You'll have names, you'll have addresses, you'll have which teacher they're with, which school they're with, possibly their um, location. Uh, you might want to have the spreadsheet include their parent's name or their guardian with a contact information. I would always add any allergies or anything like that that you know. You want to think about that the students may be just at a school class or maybe just a bridge class for this series, but perhaps as you build, they also go other places. So you need information about them. And you need volunteers to help the teachers in the classroom. Um, and you need a volunteer that will let the teacher teach and just reinforce what the teacher is telling them. Just those physical things that the kids have to learn. How to fan cards, keep the cards duplicate style, how to use a bidding box. Um, making sure that everybody keeps moving. You know, when someone really is in a quandary and doesn't remember what you said, that can remind them what the teacher suggested they do in that situation. So, you know, there's probably a million other things that you haven't even thought of or I've thought of that you're going to need volunteers. You need to really think about all the things that you'd like to accomplish, all the things that you would like to happen, and think not only about the main people, you know, the teachers or the, the administrator that talks to them, but also about what kind of volunteers you're going to. Supplies. Teaching supplies. So what do you need for teaching the class? You need the books that you're going to be using to teach. Cards, playing cards, duplicate boards, bidding boxes, directional table mats, and probably card holders. Now, card holders... Kind of neat. I can. I got a little thing on the Jumpstart Bridge website that tells you how to build a card holder. So that can even be an art project. That'd be fun. Um, but you're going to need somebody to uh, make sure the supplies are available, and you're going to need someone that can move those supplies from location to location. The typical cost for the supplies to run a class is around two hundred and fifty dollars assuming three tables. Um, if, uh, and I'll talk about it in just a moment, if you use some of the materials from the Jump Start program, you also will have uh, a PowerPoint available. So you might need either a projector or someone who can help a teacher get a projector set up if they need help. Snacks. Every bridge player loves snacks. The kids are no different. But when you're doing snacks for a, a youth club, think about allergies, especially like a peanut allergy. That's a real prominent allergy that a lot of the kids have. Might be better just to leave peanuts out, you know, anything that has a peanut base. 
sign-up sheets. You always need sign-up sheets with contact information and parental information. Um, I cannot say how important it is for every class you have to have a sign-up sheet that gives you their name, how to contact them, the parent or guardian's name, how to contact them, and to find out about any special needs. They might have allergies. Um, some have, um, maybe don't handle uh, groups well or uh, stress very well. You know, it might be a meltdown. You need to know how to contact a guardian or parent. Oh, one of my favorite things. That's a joke. Administration. Are you going to be a nonprofit? If you are a nonprofit, then in the States, and I assume it's the same as overseas, nonprofits can accept donations and those are tax deductible for the donors. You need to find out if you're thinking of going that way, which I suggest you do, what legal steps need to be followed. And find a lawyer that is interested in youth bridge to draw something up. Um, but there are going to be legal steps that you have to take if you're a nonprofit in terms of reporting your income and donate, excuse me, and your donations. So who is going to be responsible for reporting your income and expenses? And I'm not just saying if you have to do it for legal reasons, your donors, uh, the people involved in your organization other than just you and you know one or two people you need to be transparent you need to let people know what kind of money you're getting in and what your expenses are you don't have to get down to the you know we gave you know marianne ten dollars for candy all right but you want to have a general this is where the money came in, this is what we spent it on, and this is what we accomplished. You might need uh, liability insurance, so think about that. Who's going to pay your teachers? Are you going to pay your teachers? Who's going to order the supplies and pay for them? Who's in charge of any contractual obligations? If you're paying your teachers, you probably need to have some kind of document that explains what you expect from them and what their obligations are in order to be paid. Finances. Again, are you going to pay your teachers? That's a big one. Are you going to pay an organizer? Is there someone involved in the organization that's going to be kind of the overseer of everything that goes on, and is that person going to be paid? If so, again, you probably want some type of, if you don't want to call it a contract, something that spells out what you expect them to be doing. Who pays for travel expenses? If the teachers uh, are getting paid for travel or if you're going to a tournament or something like that, who is going to pay for that? Will the organizer or the teacher pay their own expenses or is, or, or is the company, the, or, the youth organization going to pay for them? And how? And what's gonna be able to be expensed? Who pays for snacks? You have snacks at uh, a school game. Where do the snacks come from? Who's going to pay for those snacks? Is there going to be a budget for snacks? They, all these things. And do you need to buy supplies? You know, that's going to be a big amount. You do not want to use old, dirty, broken supplies. You're going to be, for the people that do not play bridge, that you're walking in, to a school or a library or anywhere else saying we want to teach bridge to children here and we're not going to charge you anything and we're really excited about this and let us get started and then pull out a box of nasty supplies okay you do not want anything that is dirty uh, broken written on you want to have things that look nice they have to be brand new no, but they do need to be clean and nice. Are you going to charge your students? If so, what are those fees going to cover? You know, are you going to have t-shirts for your group? Are you going to have a logo? Um, you need to think, are we trying to cover the entire cost of a class, assuming you're going to charge? 
or do we just want to get it, you know, subsidized? So think about that. Um, one person, when we first set up Atlanta Junior Bridge, which we don't charge the kids anything, someone said to me, well, every family has $20 that they can pay for their child to learn bridge. They're used to paying. Everybody can do it. I don't think that's true. I think there are some families that don't have $20 or $30 or $40 or whatever the going rate is now to um, spend on something that's not a necessity. So we assumed since we were a nonprofit that the parents that could afford to pay for their child to do bridge would donate. And the people that could not pay uh, would not. But since nobody was paying, it was okay. They wouldn't be embarrassed if they couldn't pay me. I'll say that didn't work out quite the way we thought. Um, a lot of parents, even though I believe they might have been able to pay for their child to learn bridge, did not give us any donations. But hey, many did. That's something you need to decide. Marketing important. This may seem like, you know, kind of a, a knit, okay? Um, you need to have a name, a logo, a website, a phone number, an email address. How does someone get in touch with you if they've heard about you and they'd like to start a program? You want to be visible. You want to advertise your classes and or your availability to teach a class. So existing classes and upcoming classes, ones you want people to contact you for you to create a program for them. The organization may not care if they get recognition for their hard work, but recognition is how you keep your existing funding and raise more. Take pictures, create flyers, make posters, create and maintain a website. Who can do that for you? Who will maintain your database? How will you contact players? You might have someone that was in your very first program, but then had to drop out and they want to come back. Well, they need you need to stay in contact with them and let them know that you're starting a new class. You need to network, okay? Network, network, network. And you need to find somebody in marketing who can help you. And now your teachers. What experience or credentials are you going to require? Are you going to let anybody come in and teach? Or are you going to require some kind of training? My suggestion would be that you want, uh, you don't have to have a great bridge player but to be a teacher, but they need, do need to be a good teacher and they need to like children. Okay? So maybe you run uh, some kind of program to train the teachers so that they can help you um, uh, help promote your program and who's going to oversee their performance. Are you just going to hire a teacher or get someone to come teach and send them away and never look and see how they did? You need to have some idea of uh, what type of teaching they are going to be good at and are they going to be good with children? Do you require your teachers to be vetted by some kind of government agency in the States most of the schools and recreation centers that are government owned or you know county or city owned uh, run official background checks on people who are going to be dealing with the children. Um, as an organization, Atlanta Junior Bridge ran background checks on everyone who was one of our teachers. The Boy Scouts of America actually have online uh, training that they call an online training. They call youth protection training. I recommend that you know volunteers or teachers who can be in, that are going to be in direct contact with the students go through that or some training like that. Kind of tells you you know do's and don'ts um, about, for instance, like not traveling alone in the car with only one student. You know that type of thing as an adult. Parents will appreciate the fact that you are concerned about their children, and that you want to make sure that you have qualified people people who understand the do's and don'ts of dealing with children and people who like children with their kids. Are you going to team teach or have one teacher per class? 
from experience, I can say that when you have one teacher teaching a class all by themselves, it can become a chore instead of a joy. When one teacher is responsible, they kind of um, bond with the kids and they don't want to miss a class and disappoint the kids that they don't have bridge that week. However, most of us bridge players, uh, tend, this tends to be like our second career. And we have things we want to do. We have families of our own. We have weddings to go to, vacations to take, um, you know, things that we would like to do just for ourselves. If we have committed to teaching a bridge class, we might miss out on some of those. And then that starts to build a little resentment. And then, you know, suppose we're ill and we think, oh, but I'll have to cancel the class. If you team teach, if you can get two teachers or three teachers per class that work together well, then what you can do is when one teacher gets ill, has a vacation, has a family commitment, they can go ahead and do exactly what they need to do. The other teachers pick up. The students have, um, uh, they're comfortable with the other teachers because they've known them the whole time. So you're not putting the entire burden on one teacher to always be there every week. What happens then is they're more likely to stay for a long time. So really think about team teaching. You have volunteers to help the teachers. If you are team teaching, I would still say maybe one volunteer, maybe two, depending on who you have and how large the class is. Um, the volunteers can certainly help the teacher, but typically volunteers cannot replace the teacher. So I still think team teaching is a good idea, but a volunteer is a good idea as well. Are your teachers being paid and do you have a contract? Again, and we talked about this in the financial considerations and the administration. Even if your teachers are not being paid, I strongly believe that there should be an understanding on both your sides in writing of what their duties are, what your duties are, and be clear and upfront so everyone knows what to expect. Um, that way, if things don't work out, nobody can have really hurt feelings about it because it was all up front. This is what we thought you would be doing. Don't reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of resources available to help you with your youth program. I've listed a few of which I'm familiar with, which are mostly um, United States organizations. The jumpstartbridge.org, that is the new initiative by Atlanta Junior Bridge, the one I've been working on. We're trying to get school teachers interested in sponsoring bridge clubs and teach, learning how to teach the children bridge themselves. Um, we've been to the ISTE conference. I'm going to the Gifted conference in November, uh, Gifted Teacher Conference. There's a ton of stuff on that website. There's a curriculum that has a teacher guide, a, a workbook for the students, and a PowerPoint. Um, that's all available. It's for free. There's nothing anywhere on any of these sites I'm going to give you that cost you any money. Uh, there's also some testimonials by teachers, by students, by parents about the value of Bridge and what it's worth. There's some videos of um, different kids playing Bridge that have been up there. There's a new video I ha don't have up yet from the group in uh, Orange, New Jersey. But I'll have that up probably by the time we finish this talk. Um, but there's a, a lot of stuff on there. So go there and see if there's anything that you need. ACBL.org, if you go to the School Bridge Lesson Program, has a lot of information for you and some copies of flyers and things like that. Bridge Teachers for Youth. That is a site that I created uh, back in the heyday of Atlanta Junior Bridge. Some of it is outdated. Uh, some of the, uh, I've tried to keep up with the links, but you know, it's been over 20 years now or almost 20 years. So things happen. But there are some flyers on there, some teaching posters, some curriculums, um, quizzes for the kids, some short workbooks, just all kinds of different things that you might want to look at 
just kind of sift through and see if there's something there of interest. Everything on all of these sites, all the resources are free. So you know, just take a look at whatever you want to look at. Well, that's the end. I uh, hope that I gave you some things to think about that um, are useful to you. Um, I do believe in general that uh, unit or club run organizations, or, you know, some bridge organization might have uh, more success in the long run of keeping a program active. As people get older and start to age out a little bit, it's hard to keep if you're an individual, all the pieces moving. Uh, there might be more continuity if uh, a club or a bridge organization kind of takes ownership of the program. Uh, but I hope that you just do it. It's so much fun. And the kids are wonderful. And sharing bridge with them is a true joy. So uh, again, I hope this gave you some uh, ideas of things you might try and things you might do. Feel free to reach out to me if you have uh any questions or ideas or you've been thinking about doing it a specific way and you want to know if I've ever tried that or if you had luck doing that or I don't know, just anything. Um, again, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you have fun teaching kids. I certainly have. Thank you.